ठीक है ओके मूविंग सर स्टार्ट डियर फ्रेंड्स सॉरी फॉर द इंटरप्शन नाउ डॉक्टर सिरीगुरी इज लाइक आफ्टर अवर इनग्रल सेशन द टेक्निकल फॉर द टेक्निकल सेशन आई हमली इनवाइट डॉक्टर सिरीगुरी फॉर हिज प्रेजेंटेशन सो सर आई एम चेकिंग फॉर योर प्रेजेंटेशन आई एम प्रिपेयरिंग यू हैव ओपन योर स्लाइड योर लाइव विद योर स्लाइड सर okay yes sir you can see your slides and okay and other people please confirm about the uh, things okay sir is it okay yes yes yes, yes, yes. okay sir please good to go all right, all right. Uh, namaskar and uh, good morning everyone on behalf of uh, ugc dae consortium for scientific research and the swayam cell at uh, at chandi garhwal university uh, i welcome you all for this uh, online awareness national awareness workshop of the ugc da consortium for scientific research uh so we are going to start the technical sessions and the talks and uh, this talk would be on the most important technique which is used through the mumbai center that is the national center national facility for neutron beam research at bhabha atomic research center trombe mumbai so i would like to give you a small brief glimpse about how neutrons can be used as probes of condensed matter i am vasudev sirguri from the ugc da consortium at mumbai center mumbai So at the outset, of course, let me thank uh, Professor Ajay Samalti of H N B Kadwal University for taking up this initiative to organize this uh, workshop. And I also uh, would like to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues, especially Dr. Sujin Rayaprol, who has also worked uh, quite hard to organize this meeting. So without much delay, let me just proceed with my talk. <coughs> so the plan of talk would be uh, i'll give you a brief idea about uh, our mandate and the scope of our uh, mumbai center of ugc da csr there are other speakers from uh, other centers of the consortium who will be talking about the facilities which are accessible and at the centers at different parts of the country so i'll be uh laying some emphasis on the nfnbr or the national facility for neutron beam research which is at dhruva reactor brc mumbai and then i'll also talk about some of the in house advanced research facilities which are available at mumbai center then i'll just take you through a small uh, uh story or a journey through the neutron uh why you need to use neutron why and how neutrons are important in our research and then i'll try to summarize at the end so the ugc dae consortium for scientific research is basically ugc stands for the university grants commission and dae of course is the department of atomic energy so in some time during early 90s it there was a there was a thought by the concerned competent people that uh, we should try to bring these two together these two institutions of the country together and for the benefit of all the uh, research community in the country so that's how the ugc da consortium for scientific research was born earlier it was it used to be called the inter university consortium for da facilities so basically the intention is to promote encourage and support research using the mega facilities or the so called large scale facilities among the universities and research institutes across the country 
and through this process we facilitate access to the neutron beam facilities at dhruva reactor brc the indus synchrotron at uh, raja ramana center for advanced technology at indore cyclotron uh, facility at vcc kolkata and some uh, low energy accelerators at uh, igp kalpakam apart from this we have also set up very high end research facilities at each of our centers and these are meant for the utilization by the university scientists and as i said earlier the hallmark of these uh, facilities are uh, is that they are all absolutely free of charge for the university community so in this process we hope to add value to the research carried out in our universities and help in the realization of novel scientific ideas so these are the typical very typical uh, spread uh, of the user groups across the country that whom we support and as you can see it's fairly evenly distributed right across the country in fact this particular map uh, dates back to some uh, i would say probably a few years or presently i think uh, we are even more representative uh, across the country the mandate at mumbai center especially has been to act like an interface between the university fraternity and the big science facilities at baba tamil research center and we speci specifically facilitate and promote the use of neutron scattering facilities and at dhruva reactor and, and now many more other facilities by uh, university scientists and this we try to do through the support of uh, by supporting university scientists through collaborative research schemes so these are very small uh, projects which are basically meant to have access to these facilities and uh, then we have also built and installed one neutron diffractometer with some very special sample environment at the dhruva reactor some a few years ago which is now completely operational and uh, we also organize workshops and outreach programs like this uh, the present one which you are participating on uh, neutron scattering and other complementary techniques so usually the mode through which we do this is that we go out to these different parts of the country physically and then talk to and interact with uh, the research students as well as faculty so nothing like that but uh, unfortunately at this time we are unable to do that so this is next best thing which one can do and we also set up several facilities which are complementary to neutron scattering techniques and as i said this we hope to add value to uh, the research carried out in our universities so the research reactors in mumbai are uh, what is called the cyrus reactor which is now not operational and the dhruva reaction where we find all the action taking place so all the neutron scattering facilities are centered at dhruva reactor now <clears throat> so this is a view uh, the plan view of the uh, national facility for uh, neutron beam research and uh, so you can see that uh, this is the reactor core and uh, then you can see several tubes coming out from the core so these are uh, what are called the neutron beam tubes through which neutrons are led out of the reactor and then all the small instruments you see here are the actual neutron scattering instruments through which we actually perform the experiments neutron scattering experiments <coughs> so there are several such uh, instruments which have been basically established by the baba atomic research center and uh, we have also as i said set up one diffractometer a high resolution powder neutron diffractometer with special sample environment at uh, dhruva reactor this is the ugc dae csr diffractometer we also have facilities for neutron activation analysis Uh, which uh, people working in the area of uh, uh, biology life sciences and uh, even uh, like archaeology etc they are quite interested in this neutron uh, activation analysis this is a view of the 
the powder diffractometer which we have actually built or the consortium has built. <clears throat> so I will be talking a little bit more about this uh, uh, diffractometer later. Then we have also set up uh, several characterization facilities. Uh, namely, we have a nine Tesla physical property measurement system, which is coupled to a vibrating sample magnetometer. Then we have a, a, a broadband dielectric spectroscopy system. Then we also have uh, 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 dynamic light scattering uh, setup, which is basically meant for uh, um, particle size distributions, and nanoparticles, etc. And we have several sample preparation facilities like furnaces, ball mills, arc melters, etc. And then we have one more uh, physical property measurement system, which is a 14 Tesla system. And uh, this has several options, which I will try to briefly talk to you about. Then we have one X-ray diffractometer, it's a benchtop system, which is also available for characterization. <clears throat> now coming to the, uh, the PPMS facility. So first we have, as I said, a nine Tesla relay liquefier based uh, PPMS and, uh, and a 14 Tesla Dynapool PPMS. Through these two systems, we can do all these measurements like DC magnetization, AC susceptibility, resistivity, magneto resistance, fall resistance, then angular resistivity measurements, VI curves or dB by DI curves, specific heat measurements, and thermal conductivity measurements. So all these options are possible with this uh, system. So this is a view of the vibrating sample magnetometer. So basically this instrument is used to, to measure the magnetization of your samples. And this system works round the clock 24 seven. And this is basically a nine Tesla system and based on a reliquifier based uh, uh, helium uh, container. So we have liquid helium in this container, which while during operation, it gets evaporated and then goes into this uh, system which condenses again the gas, helium gas, and then pours it back into the uh, dewar again. So it's a continuous uh, cyclic, uh, cyclic process which goes on. And then the particulars about specifications of this instrument are that the sensitivity is roughly around 10 to the minus 6 EMU. And uh, as I said, the field range is plus minus 9 Tesla. The temperature range goes from uh, the first range is 1.9 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. And the second range is on a, with the help of a noven goes from 300 Kelvin to 1000 Kelvin. Then we have an AC susceptibility attachment with this system. So that has this sensitivity. And these are the particulars about the uh, AC fields possible and the frequencies possible. So this system has been in operation uh, for quite some time and it has produced a lot of uh, measurements. Uh, measurements have been taken and produced a lot of results and a number of research papers have been published based on the, the results obtained from this machine. So typically uh, this uh, machine, we have the sample mounting uh, details, sample details, powders the requirement is about 20 to 30 milligrams. And if there are chunk, which are roughly about uh, 5 mm, uh, this big uh, size, size of chunk, which can be put on this uh, uh, sample holder. These are the sample holders. So this is a quartz sample holder, a brass truck. And uh, so this is an idea of the sample size. You can see that uh, there's a scale here. So uh, for the high temperature measurements, uh, basically we measure only on chunks and they are mounted like this in this uh, holder. And then uh, we also have a thin film holder possible with this system. And uh, then for AC susceptibility measurement, the sample requirements are fairly similar. Then we have another system, a newer system, which we purchased uh, fairly recently. This is a fully cryogen-free 14 Tesla Dynapool uh, system. 
and uh, in this we can do a variety of measurements uh, like uh, TC and AC resistivity, IV characteristics, specific heat, thermal transport, thermal conductivity, thermal power, resistivity, etc. And this is uh, the scientist concerned with the machine, uh, Dr. P. D. Babu. We can always uh, write to him for any particular uh, measurements. So these are the details of the the, the sample mounting, which is uh, available on the uh, Dynapool system. This is what is called a resistivity puck. So this is the size of your sample in which the various contacts are made. So we can have four wire measurement or a two wire measurement and we can measure hall voltages, IV characteristics and all those things. And for heat capacity, this is the what is called heat capacity puck and where a sample is suspended on fine wires and uh, so we can uh, have this uh, weight of about 10 to 20 mg sample or uh, for highly magnetic samples, you have lesser quantities are required. So this is the thermal transport uh, option or the TTO where we can measure thermal conductivity, Seebeck coefficient and thermal electric fiber of merit ZT. And again here uh, we have a sample which is about 12 to 15 mm long and a thin sample in which can be mounted this way on this, uh, this TTO puck. And then a the close up looks to something like this where there's a high, high TC uh, tape shaped sample which has been mounted on this uh, TTO puck. <clears throat> then uh, moving on we have a uh, broadband dielectric spectrometer. Uh, this is uh, also a very uh, useful machine and uh, very heavily used by university scientists. And here we have uh, both a low temperature as well as a high temperature attachment. And uh, then we have uh, the range of operation is from 3 microhertz to 20 megahertz uh, using one setup and then with another setup you can go from 1 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. So through this spectrometer we can do very high precision dielectric studies of solids and liquids and uh, so basically it's a NOVA control make alpha AN impedance analyzer which is also coupled with a key site network analyzer to go to gigahertz frequencies. And then we have a nitrogen gas uh, heating and cooling system and a high temperature furnace up to 1200 degrees centigrade. Then thin films can also be uh, measured using interdigitated electrodes. And the unique features are, as I said, the extremely broad frequency range from 3 microhertz to 3 gigahertz and a temperature range of 110 to 673 Kelvin. And then from ambient to 1473 Kelvin using the high temperature attachment. And the impedance measurement range is again from uh, 10 milli ohms to 10 to the 14 ohms. And these are the loss tangent uh, which can be measured with this high pressure and resolution. So this is very useful in transport and dynamical studies of novel materials with potential technological applications. So a number of samples like multiferroics, ferroelectrics, relaxor ferroelectrics, polymers, glasses, glass formers, Ionic liquids also have been measured with this machine. Then we have a small uh, benchtop XRD, which is a Brooker make machine. It's called the Brooker D2 phaser. It's quite a popular machine. And uh, so this machine is uh, used with a lynx eye strip detector and very fast, high quality data can be obtained. And uh, so this is in the theta theta mode where the sample remains horizontal all the time. So this facility is also one of the basic characterizing facilities that we have, we offer. Now coming to the radiation processes. So as you all know that uh, the most common choice of radiation which people use for characterizing the samples are X-rays, very commonly used. And X-rays are available as I shown you just a little earlier through lab sources which are relatively uh, quite inexpensive and they're fairly easy to install and use and uh, they require very very small sample quantities or the microgram sample quantities. So, uh, so if uh, you have such a very convenient uh, uh, reason to use uh, X-rays then why is it that you like to use or think about using 
neutrons. So this we need to know for something about the neutron properties. So as you all know, uh, neutrons are subatomic particles like protons. They were discovered in 1932 by Chadwick. And then uh, you also know that a neutron has some unique properties. They are neutral particles. Neutrons have no charge. And you have this particle wave behavior. And then this is the mass of the neutron. And this is the size of the neutron. And one of the very unique uh, properties that uh, neutrons have is that they possess magnetic moments by virtue of uh, the neutron spin. It's a spin half particle. So the magnetic moment uh, is on order of 1.9 uh, nuclear magnetons. So this property again makes it a very, very powerful probe to examine magnetic uh, systems. So as you know, we can uh, have this uh, wave particle duality formula. So you can convert from kinetic energy to velocity and temperature using these uh, typical formulae, which are available in any holistic physics book. <clears throat> so the neutron sources, which are the neutron sources, okay? So we have two types of sources, basically nucle nuclear reactors, which are also called continuous sources of neutrons. So here the reactor, uh, what happens is that uh, you start with some neutrons and then there's a nuclear fission process, a controlled nuclear fission process, which undergoes inside where a neutron uh, falls on a, uranium-235 nucleus and it produces the average 2.5 neutrons where 1.5 neutrons from that are used to keep the chain reaction going and, and then one neutron is used for making the neutron beams and the typical you can see this is the uh, fission process the typical nu uh, nuclear reactors across the world we have Bruwa reactor at Mumbai then we have the ILL or the Institut Low Langevin at Grenoble in France. Then we have National Institute for Standards at uh, Maryland in the United States. And then we have the Opal in Australia, Sydney, Australia, and many, many more across the world. So these are some typical examples of continuous sources. Apart from continuous sources, we have what are called the pulse neutron sources, which are not so many in number, but they are now coming up. And one of the most popular ones, uh, which is available pulse neutron source is at uh, uh, in, in UK, where is the Rutherford Ableton Laboratories near Oxford. And we have the intense pelation source called the ISIS at uh, RL UK. And then we also have the, the, the American pelation source. And then a new one is coming up in uh, Europe, uh, in Sweden near Lund and so there uh, this pulse neutron sources are now the current order of the day which are being developed across the world. So I will not talk about those uh, systems now because we are going to focus our attention at uh, around Dhruva reactor which is a continuous reactor source. So, uh, <clears throat> so when uh, I showed you earlier a plan of the reactor where you have at the center you have a reactor core and the reactor core is typically surrounded by what is called a moderator. Okay, so all the neutrons which are produced in, at the source when they, when they come out, they mix with the moderator, which is heavy water in our case at Drova reactor, and then they they lose their energies and then it get equalized, thermalized to the temperature of the moderator. So this is the equation which actually converts the energy and then tells you how uh, the energy of neutron would be. And then, <clears throat> so what we can do is that uh, the neutrons which are moderated by heavy water, which is usually kept around room temperature, these are called thermal neutrons. So thermal neutrons are the most uh, uh, common ones which are available, which come from the reactor. But suppose, uh, you, uh, you can see that uh, you can convert the energy, which is order of uh, a few milli electron volts, you can convert this into uh, wavelength also here. So th these wavelengths of these therm thermal neutrons is typically order of one angstroms to 
two, two or three angstrom in wavelength. But suppose we have some requirement where you want a much lower energy neutron or a longer wavelength neutron, then you have to lower the energy of the neutron and that is done by what is called a cold moderator source. Okay. And typically we put a small uh, volume of uh, liquid deuterium inside uh, the reactor core and then the neutrons which come through this uh, source, they'll get moderated to these temperatures and lose their energy and hence they are called cold neutrons. Similarly, so they are of very long wavelength neutrons, typically five angstroms and above. Typically, you can also, uh, you may also require very high energy neutrons, much more than the thermal neutrons which are available at the reactor. So for this purpose, then we have to introduce a small source inside the core, inside the moderator, uh, where, and then heat it up, and that is called a hot moderator source. So we have typically it's like graphite, which is heated up to 2000 Kelvin, and the neutrons which mix, uh, which, uh, which go through this material, they get moderated to these temperatures and hence they are called hot neutrons. So they are high energy neutrons or uh, lower wavelength neutrons. So you can see that this is a lower, uh, lower wavelength or high energy neutrons, which are like this. And then these are the, this is the Maxwellian for the thermal neutrons. And then this is the Maxwellian for the uh, low energy or long wavelength neutron. So depending on the requirement of your uh, experiment, you can use either of this, uh, uh, any of these types of neutrons or they are all available. So, but otherwise typically thermal neutrons are always available. So most of the experiments are centered around the thermal neutron energy. So what I will describe in the slides ahead are all using uh, what are called the thermal neutrons. So this is the energy temperature wavelength uh, uh, table which shows the corresponding energies, temperatures and the wavelengths of the neutron. So for cold and cold neutrons, the energies are typically in the range of 0.1 to 10 millietron, milli electron volts. So these are in the temperatures ranging from 1 to 120 Kelvin and they have wavelengths ranging from 4 or 5 angstroms up to 30 angstroms. Then we have the most uh, commonly available uh, neutrons, which are the thermal neutrons. We have where they they have the energies in the range of 5 to about 100 millietron volts. And then, uh, so these temperatures are in this range and the wavelengths are typically 1 to 4 angstrom wavelength. And then the hot neutrons, they are available in these energy ranges up to 500 millietron volts. And then these are the temperatures which are concerned with them. And then they can go down to up to 0.4 angstroms in wavelength. So these are short wavelength neutrons which are sometimes required in certain experiments. So now having told you about uh, what are the kinds of uh, different uh, neutrons which can be obtained from the reactor, then we now ask the questions, why do you want to use neutrons for your research? So the very first property which anyone comes across is the charge of the neutron. Because as we all know, neutrons do not have any charge. Because they don't have any charge, they have the property that they can penetrate deeply into matter. Okay, Because they have no charge, they do not interact with anything, so they can simply penetrate deep into anything you put in their path. So this way you can actually study the bulk of the material which you are trying to, uh, which you want to study. So, for example, with X-rays, it's not so much possible to to go deep into a material because they get attenuated. Because X-rays, they are charged uh, uh, beams. But whereas a neutron, because they are chargeless particles, they can go very deep inside uh, materials. So that is a very important property which neutrons have that uh, they are free of any charge. Then, uh, so these are the, so how do neutrons interact with uh, matter? So neutrons mainly interact with the atomic nuclei. So these are like uh, atoms, uh, uh, an area of atom, atoms placed here in a, in a solid. So you can see that these dots are the nuclei which are surrounded by some electronic uh, orbits. So the primary interaction of neutron is with the atomic nuclei. And this interaction happens to be extremely 
short range interaction through femto range, uh, uh, femtometer range forces. So that's a very important uh, 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 property, and uh, so where neutrons interact with atomic nuclei through very very short range forces. So there are certain implications because of this nature of this interaction. And since, as I said, neutrons also have spin. Yes, they are spin half particles. They have magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment of the neutron can also interact if you have an unpaired electron in your sample. That means your sample is magnetic in nature, okay, like iron, nickel, chromium, etc., or rare earths, which have unpaired electrons in their outermost orbits, giving rise to very uh, uh, giving rise to magnetic moments. So in case you have such uh, atoms in the in your system, then neutron through its magnetic moment can interact with the magnetic moment of your sample through a magnetic dipole interaction. Okay. So this is a very important thing. So you can see that uh, neutron penetrates quite deeply and primarily interacts with the nucleus of the atom. And by virtue of its spin or magnetic movement, it can also interact with the unpaired electron of your atom through a magnetic dipole interaction. Okay. And comparatively, if you see for X-rays, they do not go very deep into a solid and they before they get attenuated and they interact basic X-rays interact basically with the electrons present around the atom. Okay. So that is the primary basic difference between how neutrons interact with uh, matter and how X-rays interact with matter. Okay. So as I said, neutrons interact primarily through the nuclei of the atom, whereas X-rays, they interact with the electron clouds, okay, they interact with, get scattered by the electrons of the atom, okay. Okay. <clears throat> so this, what, how is this neutron nucleus interaction? So basically, it's a very weak interaction with matter and the range of this nuclear force is the order of one femtometer. So this range, one femtometer is much, much less than the neutron wavelength, which is typically order of, as I told you, order of one angstrom, for example. So for one angstrom and one femtometer is orders of difference here. So the range of interaction is so small compared to the wavelength, the scattering is like a point-like scattering. And hence, this can be described by a Fermi pseudo potential uh, of a nucleus at Rj which is given by this quantity here and this interaction is governed, this potential is governed by a single parameter which is called the neutron scattering length. So each element in the periodic table has a, a unique neutron scattering length which is called B. So this is the most important parameter which determines the, the potential okay, or how the neutron interacts with the nucleus. So then we talk about what is called a scattering cross-section. So what is the cross scattering cross-section? Basically, it's the effective area presented by nucleus to an incident neutron. So we have uh, what is called a total scattering cross-section given by this quantity. And more important one is the differential scattering cross-section, which is d sigma by d omega it just gives you the number of scattered neutrons per second into an angle element d omega over the, the total incident neutron flux. And then one more com uh, complication would be have a double differential scattering cross section where you not only look at the uh, element angle to which they are scattered, but you also look at the energies. So that means the number of scattered neutrons per second into an angle element d omega and with energies between E prime and E prime plus delta E prime. So this is what is called a double differential scattering transition. Then we have combining this, we have what is called a scattering law for neutrons, which is given by D sigma by D omega by D E prime, which is given by K prime by K, which is the scattering, uh, the incident vector and the scattered vector and S is called a scattering function. So this is a function of Q or the angle and omega where you have energy here. 
so uh, you can actually uh, have two different uh, ways of interaction so here the most normal is the elastic scattering part where you only look at the elastic scattering as a function of q q is nothing but 4 pi sin theta by lambda so you have through this elastic interaction you get what are called diffraction patterns okay so these are what are called a bragg peaks or the bragg structural peaks coming out so elastic peak is centered at t equal to 0 and then you can also have if you can do the energy analysis see in this process elastic process there is no energy loss considered but in principle you can also have energy losses or energy gains so here you can what is called the inelastic scattering process where you have a loss or gain of energy of the scattered neutron so that can also be analyzed and found out where from which you can get what is called the inelastic scattering peaks. So basically the structure tells you about the static part uh, of, the, of the sample of your atomic system whereas this one the energy analysis gives you the dynamics of the system. So how the atoms are vibrating etc. phonons or magnons etc. So that inelastic scattering part gives you that answer. So, as I said, uh, the other next important one is the wavelength of neutrons are comparable to the interatomic distances. As I said, the wavelength is typically around 1 to 4 angstroms for thermal neutrons, and interatomic distances in any system are also the similar order. For example, some 3 angstroms, 4 angstroms, or 10 angstroms are the interatomic distances between uh, the atoms in your. Uh, sample so that gives you the answers about the structure of the sample then the energies of the neutron as i pointed out are few milli electron volts and these energies are comparable to the atomic vibrations present in your system since these two energies are capable you can utilize this neutrons to look at the dynamics of the system so how the atoms are vibrating about their mean positions so for these two uh, uh, discoveries or the first time application of neutrons to determine these two quantities, the structure of materials and the dynamics. Okay? So for that reason in 1994 Nobel Prize for Physics was given to Clifford Schull and uh, Brockhaus. Schull was from the United States, Brockhaus was from Canada. So uh, what did Schull do? He showed that neutrons can show where the atoms are, that is the positions of the atoms. Okay. So when the neutrons are incident with atoms in the sample, they can change direction and they are scattered. So this is called elastic scattering. Okay. The neutron becomes like that, they get scattered by the sample and then you measure the angular distribution and the Bragg piece. So this is elastic scattering. Then similarly, as I said, atoms are not uh, static at their positions. They are all the time vibrating at their positions. And because they are vibrating, so if you can have a probe which is of similar order of energies, they can get scattered and also in the process either take energy from these vibrations or give up energies and then get scattered. And if you are able to analyze the energies of the scattered radiation, neutrons in this case, you can have an idea about how these atoms are actually vibrating about their positions. So you can get the elastic constants and all those quantities of the, uh, the dynamic quantities of the uh, atoms in a system. So for these two discoveries, so these two gentlemen were awarded the Nobel Prize and this is how a Nobel Prize actually medal looks like and, uh, and I was quite fortunate to actually hold this medal which was given to uh, Dr. Clifford Schull because his son Robert Schull happens to be also a physicist and he had visited uh, the uh, Atomic Research Center some years ago and he brought this Nobel medal which was awarded to his father to show everybody. So we were quite happy to see this and hold this medal at least uh, in our lifetime. Then the other property is that uh, uh, neutrons have they have a random scattering amplitude across the periodic table. 
so what do you mean by this see now unless you compare it with x ray you don't understand what this means see if you have x rays how x rays are scattered by different elements across the periodic table you can see that the scattering power of x rays goes on increasing with the number of electrons around the atom so the more number of electrons you have the more uh, scattering of x rays can happen so a scattering power of an atom increases with this atomic number so the more the number of electrons more heavily x rays can get scattered but one downside about this problem uh, this side uh, this uh, phenomena is that suppose you have a very high z element over here which is which is a, a, which is a compound with uh, a very low z element sitting here you can see that all the scattering is dominated by the high z element so the presence of the low z element in the high z uh, environment gets totally obscured so that is the problem of uh, x ray scattering with uh, alloy, with alloys or compounds containing both i z elements as well as low z elements so uh, but with neutrons you don't have such problems because neutrons do not the main interaction of neutrons as i said is with the atomic nuclei so the neutron nuclei or nuclear interaction does not have this kind of a, a monotonous dependency so the neutron scattering amplitudes uh, they vary totally randomly across the periodic table like this line here so almost all atoms across the periodic table they scatter neutrons equally well okay so you have so no problem of having a low z element and a high z element together or neighboring elements etc you don't have any problems when you work with neutron because each nucleotide scatters neutrons totally differently okay so locating neighboring elements or the locating the presence of light elements in the presence of heavy elements becomes quite possible with neutron scattering which is not very often possible with x ray scattering so the just to give you an idea how x rays look at elements is something like this they say this is hydrogen and then going across the periodic table you have manganese and iron so this is how the 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 atoms appear to x rays so low z elements are like very small uh, high z elements appear quite big in terms of scattering power but for neutrons almost all of them are equally same so you have uh, you have a totally uneven distribution of the magnitudes okay so like you have uh, a larger magnitude here but a smaller magnitude again a larger magnitude smaller and much smaller like that so this is how x rays will look at uh, elements so uh, one very typical example which you can see is that potassium chloride so potassium chloride you know is an ionic solid and this is a unique system because in potassium chloride the k plus ion the k plus ion and cl minus have the same number of electrons so because they have the same number of electrons and they are not differentiated by x ray so x ray pattern of kcl looks as if that this is not a, a phase, interpenetrating phase center cubic lattice it more, looks more like a uh, simple cubic lattice whereas the same material now if you put it in a neutron beam and because the neutron scattering lengths for potassium and chlorine are very much distinct and different so they are seen differently by the neutrons so then the actual pattern really actually looks like this you can see that all the lines which are missing in the case of x ray patterns they are all coming out here clearly so this shows the power of uh, the neutron over the x ray and as i said locating light elements okay in the presence of heavy elements for example oxygen in the presence of uh, say barium or yttrium etc this was uh, used for the first time to determine the structures of the itc 1 2 3 compounds <laughs> the other uh, very important uh, property because of this uh, interaction of neutrons with nuclei is that 
the pattern distributions are, are possible with more accuracy as compared to uh, X-ray scattering. So this is this property is typically used in the case of ferrites, which are very popular uh, technologically important uh, materials, and where this scatter distributions are extremely important uh, in the case of ferrites. So to determine the scatter distributions, it is very important to know the right uh, distribution, and hence neutrons come in very useful in this. <coughs> So the main uh, thing which I want to convey here is that the uh, basically the other uh, yeah the next property is the, what is called a form factor dependence. With X-rays, usually since X-rays interact with uh, electrons which are on the outer on the orbits around the nuclei, okay, X-ray intensities they tend to fall off with two, two theta or the angle. So why does this happen? That is because the intensity is a square mod square of the structure factor, where structure factor is given by this quantity, where here Fn is called the atomic scattering amplitude, and this is given by this equation. So what does this equation show? Basically, this is the Fourier transform. So it is the Fourier transform of the <coughs> spatial extent. So this is the spatial extent of the scattering density. With, uh, with X-rays, the scattering density are electrons. They are quite widely distributed. Uh, and since they have a wide uh, spatial extent, so a Fourier transform, you know, what happens is that when you extend the Q, it falls off in intensity. But now, because if the scattering density is like a, like a delta function, okay. So a scattering density with a delta function like or a point-like scatterer, if you take the Fourier transform, you know it is flat. So the neutron intensities do not fall with angle, so they remain constant. So this is also a very important uh, property which uh, neutrons have, and uh, which is very effectively used to find the correct structures. Okay. Neutron intensities do not fall off with angle. One example you can see here is the same sample, a terbium barium uh, oxide, where uh, this is the diffraction pattern using the synchrotron X ray. So, even though we have very powerful X ray uh, source here, you can see that the intensities fall off with angle because of the form factor. So this is nothing but the form factor which is killing the intensity. But whereas with neutron, the same sample, if you put it in a neutron uh, radiation, you can see that we have very, very strong intensities even at the uh, 2 theta of around 130 degrees in angle. So this is one very nice uh, property which neutrons have that uh, they don't have any form factor dependence and then the intensity do not fall off the angle. <clears throat> then uh, another very important aspect is that here neutrons have very different interactions with different isotopes of the same atom. This is something which X-rays don't uh, have. Because X-rays interact only with the new electrons. So they don't bother what is the construction of the nucleus of that atom. Okay. So the scattering from two isotopes of the same atom with X-rays will give the same result because the number of electrons is all same. But because the nuclear structure for two different isotopes of the same atom is different, and because the nuclear structure is different, and because neutrons interact with the nucleus, the interaction will be different for different isotopes. So this can be very effectively used uh, in small angle neutron scattering measurements, which Dr. Aswal will talk to you later uh, in this uh, workshop. And, uh, and many other uh, possibilities are also there. This is the case of hydrogen. Hydrogen has an isotope called uh, deuterium. And uh, the scattering for the two is absolutely different. You can see here, like, for uh, hydrogen, the scattering core and 
scattering cross section here is given by uh, 1.7 the coherent scattering and the incoherent scattering cross section is 80 but whereas if you take the isotope deuterium you can see the difference here so the difference is coming out very clearly over here so in this case it is incoherent scattering is 80 and here the coherent incoherent scattering is 2 incoherent scattering actually contributes largely to the background so you can see hydrogenous samples give very large background because of this large incoherent scattering cross section so if you replace the hydrogen atom with deuterium atom in your sample this can be totally cut down to this level so this is one typical example and another typical example is that of magnetic systems uh, hello Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can hear Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. The other case uh, is with that of, uh, for example, uh, you can see here uh, nickel. So this is a compound Ni3Fe. Okay. So here you can see that uh, uh, the, the, the scattering cross section for natural nickel is given by this 1BFe plus 3B Ni. Okay, and then this is the this is how the actual scattering cross section looks like, and uh, if you see that uh, with natural nickel, BNI is 10.3 femtometers and BFE is 9.55, and the difference uh, given by this is about 0.02. Okay, but if you replace the nickel, natural nickel with the isotope, which is 60 nickel, okay, and substitute it, then for that, the scattering cross section is totally different. Here it is 10.3 and here it is 2.8. So the same uh, scattering cross section effectively now comes out as 0.35 in place of 0.02. So you can see that how replacing it with an isotope makes so much difference to the way the neutrons get scattered by the nuclei. Then of course the most important for uh, uh, many people is the magnetic movement. So neutrons have, uh, they possess, as I said, they are spin-off particles and they, are, they have a magnetic movement. And if this magnetic movement can interact with the uh, magnetic structure, okay, of the uh, atom, then they can actually give you an idea about how how the neutrons uh, uh, can interact with the magnetic atoms and then give you an idea about the magnetic structure as well as excitation which i will not talk about that. so let, let's see how neutrons uh, interact with magnetic atoms so we see that neutrons have are spin half uh, uh, quantities they have magnetic movement of uh, as i said 1.9 nuclear magnetons now, typically in 3D uh, or 4D or 5F uh, elements, we have what are called the unpaired electrons in the outermost orbits. So, the first interaction of the neutron is that it is scattered by the nucleus of the atom. So, this is called the nuclear scattering. Okay. So, neutron nucleus scattering is called nuclear scattering. So, that goes on as I described earlier over and above this nuclear scattering neutrons also interact with the unpaired electrons okay or the magnetic movements or the spins on the elements and this produces an additional scattering over and above that of the nuclear scattering okay so the neutron interacts with the magnetic moment of the atom or the electron spin okay and this gives you an additional scattering which is called magnetic scattering now, again, going back to the Fourier transform expression of uh, scattering amplitudes, which I showed you earlier, you can see that now the range of interaction here <coughs> is more extended as compared to the range of interaction with the nucleus. Since the range of interaction is more extended, now, <coughs> sorry, the Fourier transform of this will uh, result in killing of the intensity when you go to higher angles. So, the magnetic part of neutron scattering 
the magnetic part of neutron scattering also will have a form factor dependence like that of X-ray scattering and which falls off with larger fuse or 2 theta. <coughs> so how does this ma magnetic form factor work? So that is given by this uh, expression here and, uh, and how this actually interaction takes place between the neutron the spin of the neutron and the magnetic moment of the atom is described in this uh, yeah, this uh, slide here. So we have what is called a magnetic interaction vector. We define this quantity as small q, which is given by this expression. And what is epsilon here? Epsilon is the unit scattering vector in this direction. That is the perpendicular to this plane. This is the crystallographic plane containing the magnetic atom. And kappa is a unit vector along the magnetic moment of the atom. So this is the direction of the magnetic moment of the atom here, kappa. So <clears throat> here, Q is given by this expression, which can be simplified as sine alpha. The, the magnitude is given by sine alpha. So that means the magnetic interaction of the neutron with a atomic spin has a directional dependence. So as you all know, if alpha is zero, then Q becomes zero. And if alpha is 90, Q becomes one. So what does this mean? If the direction of this magnetic movement of your sample is along this unit uh, scattering vector, then the resultant Q or the magnetic part of the scattering will become zero. But if the angle between this K and epsilon is 90 degrees, that means K or kappa is along the plane of the atom. The, the movement is along the plane of the atom of this uh, HKL plane, then the magnetic scattering is at its maximum. So it has what is called a directional dependence. And this is given by this quantity. This is a coupling between the magnetic part and the nuclear part. Okay. So here you can see B square is the nu purely nuclear part of the scattering and Q square P square is the magnetic part of the scattering. And this is the term which connects both together. And uh, lambda is the U neutron polarization vector. Because you neutrons have a spin, they can get polarized also. But if you have unpolarized neutrons, if you have unpolarized neutrons, so that <coughs> uh, will go to zero. And what impli this implies is that the perpendicular component of the magnetic moment of your sample, that alone contributes to the magnet magnetic part of the scattering. Okay, nuclear part will go on as usual without any issues. But the magnetic part, okay, it depends on the direction of the magnetic moment. So the perpendicular component of magnetization actually contributes to the scattering. So now, because if you work with unpolarized neutrons, intensities will be just a sum of the nuclear part and the magnetic part, or which is called Fn square plus Q square Fm square. Okay, that is the uh, structure factor square. So how do these magnetic moments come about in atoms? Basically, they are quantum effects with unpaired electrons. And then you can see that uh, these unpaired electrons, they give rise to magnetic uh, moments. And once you have magnetic moments, you have something called a magnetic structure. So what is this magnetic structure? Now, if you look at uh, uh, a crystal which is containing uh, uh, magnetic atoms, if the thermal energy is quite large, you can see that uh, if KT is much larger than the, the JIJ or the exchange interaction between the spins, you can see that the spins are all uh, relaxing randomly at, at their positions. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you can see that uh, the average SJ becomes zero. So that is nothing but a paramagnetic state. But now if you start cooling down the system, so if the temperature can, uh, that means here the temperature has overcome the magnetic energy, all right? But if you cool down the system, okay, that means the, the exchange energy 
can uh, overcome the thermal energy, okay? So thermal energy is much, much smaller than the exchange energy. Then you can suddenly have at a, at a specific temperature point called a Curie temperature or nail temperature, you can have an ordering of this spins. So this is one typical uh, spin ordering, which is up and down, up and down, and up and down. And this is called <coughs> nothing but a antiferromagnetic nature of ordering. So now, once you have any ordering of these spins, that can also give rise to a coherent scattering by the neutrons. So this is a coherent magnetic scattering by the neutrons. Like very much you have an ordered array of uh, nuclei or the atoms giving rise to nuclear scattering and nuclear bracket. So we start with a very simple magnetic structure where we have uh, a simple square lattice, uh, a cubic lattice where the green uh, circles are representing the nuclei and the arrows are representing the spins at each nuclei. Okay? So now if all the spins are pointing up, now I can define two types of lattices. One is what is called a nuclear lattice comprising the, the nuclei and then we have a magnetic lattice comprising the spins or the arrows. Now you can see the distance between two up spins and the distance between two green circles is the same. So that means here what it means is that the magnetic lattice is identical to the nuclear lattice. Okay. So you have two different lattices. I mean this is only conceptually. They are basically the spin is on the atom itself. Okay. But it has a direction. So spin in the same direction the distance between two subsequent spins is same as that of the distance between the two atoms. So that means the magnetic lattice is coinciding with the nuclear lattice here. So what is the consequence here? So this is what is called a ferromagnetic ordering of, ordering of spins. Now if I suppose turn these spins in the middle uh, plane here down, then you have a slightly different situation because now here the distance between two green circles remain the same but then the distance between two up arrows is not the same but it is now occurring at twice the, the distance between two green circles. So that means the magnetic lattice is now not the same as that of the nuclear lattice. So the magnetic lattice in this case is twice that of the nuclear lattice. So there is a difference here. So this is nothing but what is called an antiferromagnetic state. So how does this manifest itself in the nuclear uh, neutron scattering? We will now see. Here you can see that uh, in the first case because the, <coughs> the magnetic lattice is occurring at the same uh, site as that of the nuclear lattice. So you have resultant is that you have coherent scattering coming first from the nuclei. Over and above that, you have a magnetic coherent scattering coming from the ordered array of spins in the same position. Okay, So you can see that that gives rise to additional scattering, which is purely this additional scattering is magnetic in nature, but this is occurring at the same position as that of the nuclear bracket. Now, the second case since the magnetic lattice is not same as that of the uh, nuclear lattice, you can see that there is a difference. So the coherent brass scattering which is coming from the nuclei is different from the coherent brass scattering which is coming from the spins because now spins are located at twice the distance of the nuclear lattice. You have a very unique situation where you have a, a Bragg reflection which is comprised entirely of only Bragg magnetic scattering here. So this line is coming only because of magnetic scattering that too because it is antiferromagnetically aligned. So the moment if this alignment is destroyed either by heating the, the, the sample or whatever then this line will simply disappear. This will not disappear because this is coming from the at uh, nuclei itself. But this is coming from the spins which are coherently, coherent scattering coming from the spins which are aligned 
if you break the alignment of the spins, this uh, purely magnetic scattering will get destroyed. Okay. So this is how uh, the neutrons can sense the periodic arrangement of magnetic moments. And uh, here you can see that uh, this is the diffractometer which has been set up by us and where we do carry out all these experiments at uh, Dura reactor. Likewise, there are many other uh, uh, diffractometers also present which are set up by the BRC and uh, they are also a part of this. We are a part of the entire uh, set of uh, instruments. <clears throat> so we have very good sample environment uh, uh, on this machine. You can uh, go down to 1.5 Kelvin in temperature and we also you can have a magnetic field at the sample of 7 Tesla uh, on the diffractometer. One uh, a typical example how uh, magnetic neutron scattering looks like is that this is a this is a lava space compound C15 type of compound TB MNFE is a rare earth compound. So you can see at 300 degrees there is no not much magnetic ordering and uh, it's in a paramagnetic state. So this is the order of the spectrum at room temperature. But when you start cooling the the, the sample down to 10 Kelvin, you can see that this particular peak is slowly going in intensity. So this intensity is coming purely because of the magnetic ordering and uh, since terbium has very large magnetic moments, you also can see that the, the scattering, magnetic part of the scattering is much more stronger than the nuclear part at that particular peak position. So you can see that the magnetic scattering part can be very much large in magnitude as compared to uh, is comparable to the nuclear part of the scattering. And this is a typical antiferromagnetic ordering. In fact, this is for the magnetic oxide for which uh, Clifford Schull was given the Nobel Prize. So you can see that this is a typical manganese oxide. This is at 300 Kelvin. Okay, but when you cool down this sample, you can see that this large uh, peak coming up here and also a shoulder here as well as other smaller peaks coming here. So this is nothing but the first time uh, determination of the magnetic structure of uh, manganese oxide, which was determined purely from neutron scattering experiments alone, neutron diffraction experiments alone. So neutron is probably the only probe which can actually detect the presence of antiferromagnetic order in materials. So you can have many such uh, examples and uh, this is a typical example of uh, uh, what is called a hexafarite and uh, <coughs> so you can see again here as a function of temperature when you cool down the sample you can see that uh, there is some thing coming up here as well as here and then there is also a, a, a very strong shoulder coming at uh, just around the lowest point of measurement here you can see that this is a coherent scattering which is coming up here, which is coming only because of the magnetic ordering. And by analyzing such patterns, we can actually arrive at the uh, how the magnetic structure looks like. And you can see that this is how the spins are arranged in the uh, lattice. So again, this is calculated only from the uh, neutron uh, diffraction patterns by analyzing the neutron diffraction So uh, later, I think in the next talk, Dr. Rappel will give you uh, an idea about how these things are seen, observed, measured, and calculated, and uh, analyzed. Okay. So uh, another final example I would say is, uh, as I said, the neutron has uh, a directional dependence with the magnetic moment. So this is a typical example of a sample where at uh, 520 Kelvin is in the uh, paramagnetic state or you can get what is only contribution of the uh, nuclear part. So this is only purely nuclear scattering. You pull it down to 80 Kelvin, you can see that there are some lines which have appeared here. So by analyzing this pattern, it is seen that the spins are aligned along the C direction. So because the spins are aligned along C direction, the 001, 001 peak is not present here. One can see just a small hump here. Because of the directional dependence where if the, <coughs> the movement direction is same as that of the 
neutron scattering vector, then that particular contribution goes to zero. So the contribution from OO1 has gone to zero, but not the other uh, uh, HKL lines, okay, Bragg line. But something strange happens when you pull it below 80 Kelvin, you suddenly see that uh, there is a OO1 line, which is a very strong line just appeared. So what does this mean? It means nothing but the spins which are aligned along C direction here, they have suddenly been forced to come out of the C direction. Okay. So now at due to some exchange interactions, these spins are now aligned at an angle to the C direction. Now, because they are aligned at an angle, so now there is a definite component along this side and a component along this side. So this component doesn't give you any scattering, but this component which is perpendicular to this axis, it will now give you a very strong scattering and that manifests over here. So this is what is the example of the directional dependence of nuclear uh, a magnetic neutron scattering. Okay, then I'll just briefly touch upon uh, what you can do with the uh, with the energy of the neutron. So far, what I have talked to you was purely elastic scattering, uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, the inelastic part or the energy losses or gains of the scattered neutron. But in principle, since the atoms at a finite temperature are always uh, relaxing and then uh, oscillating at their mean positions, you can actually see that the, you can, if you can do an energy analysis of the of the scattered neutrons, you can actually uh, work out and find out about the dynamics of the atoms, what is going on inside the sample. So for this, you can actually uh, measure, if you can measure the number of scattered neutrons as a function of Q as well as energy. Okay, then you can see that the probability that a neutron with incident energy E0, it leaves the sample in a solid angle about the direction omega with an energy exchange comprised between H omega minus this quantity. Okay. So this will give you a, an idea about what is the energy loss or gain of the neutron. And if you can work back, you can easily see how the, 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 the phonons or magnons uh, occur in your system. So this is called inelastic neutron scattering and this gives the answer to the question what happens when atoms are moving, whether we can determine the directions and the time dependence of this atomic motion and also to find out whether these atomic motions are periodic or not. So all these questions can be answered by what is called the inelastic neutron scattering. Okay. So to do this, we need a special spectrometer. So far, I have described only a neutron diffractometer, which comprises only two axes. But here we have three axes. The first one is the monochromator, second is the sample, and then you have analyzer. So the first part comprising the, the uh, monochromator and the sample axis. And if we have a detector here instead of this analyzer, you basically determine the uh, energy of the incident neutron. Uh, okay, if you just have an analyzer here, you only measure the elastic part. But if you can have an analyzer here, another crystal here, and measure the, the Bragg uh, uh, scattering, then you can actually determine the energy of the incident neutron as well as the energy of the scattered neutron. So this will allow the measurement of the scattering function at any point in this, this Q E, that is uh, Q and energy space physically accessible by the spectrometer. So neutron scattering has two parts. One is the elastic part, which is given the coherent part gives rise to diffraction and the incoherent part gives rise to basically collisions and most, mostly seen as background in diffraction patterns. Then we have inelastic neutron scattering where the coherent part gives you the phonons and such magnons and excit excitations like that. And the incoherent part actually gives you an idea of the single particle excitations. So you can see now the full picture here. So this is the elastic scattering part Q, where you can see the Bragg peaks and structural part you can determine. Whereas if you do the energy analysis, you can see the inelastic peaks coming up because of the periodic motions of the atoms and uh, because of the exchange of energies between the 
neutron and the nuclei you can see that these are coherent inelastic peaks coming up here and so this how the power of the neutron scattering lies so you can have a large length scales you can sample as well as large energy and time scales you can actually uh, sample by using uh, neutrons so this actually gives you a, a very powerful uh, handle on the range of uh, excitations a range of uh, the structures which you can study by uh, using neutrons so you can do uh, Bragg deflection, you can do diffuse scattering, you can do small angle scattering, you can do liquid scattering, where you can get all this kind of S of U resulting from the scattering here. Or you can do dynamics by using this kind of inelastic scattering, you can get phonons, you can get magnons, molecular vibrations, etc. And you can also do structure and couple it with dynamics. Okay. So you can get what are called phonon dispersion relations or the magnon dispersion relations, etc. So there's a whole lot of uh, physics uh, which can be studied uh, using neutrons. And neutrons, and you can apply this to a variety of uh, systems, not only uh, to condense matter, but you can range across several disciplines like biology, chemistry, etc which I'm sure you'll be seeing in the lectures which will be following now. And another very uh, uh, unique aspect is that you can do neutron imaging and uh, just like you do X-ray imaging and we now have a beamline at Drawer reactor which actually you can do neutron imaging. And neutron imaging is very, very useful in uh, certain applications uh, where you need to know or you can do radiography of the system very, very effectively and penetrate deep into the, uh, uh, the samples which you are trying to uh, observe. And this gives you again a very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah. 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 Pardon? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm sir, uh, I humbly request you, we will be switching on to the next lecture. Uh, yeah, yeah, for, uh, no, 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 no. It's not about the time, sir. But I'm requesting that actually uh, that event uh, is being recorded and that will be telecasted to that uh, to the participant at the moment. So we have created the public event for the next way. So I request you to the rest of the part and then we will continue with the Sudin sir lecture. So I'm just taking uh, I'm just uh, you know uh, activating the new ID which have been communicated to all the. Uh, uh, participant attendees okay. so that this thing will be continued so whatever the remaining slides plus the search uh, presentation okay. will be taken over so that they can ask the question later on in connectivity sir okay so should i should i continue or stop for some time sir, I, I request you to stop at this moment then from okay. this slide only we will be okay. continuing immediately okay. on that uh, direction okay. 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 okay okay thank you sir thanks a lot yeah. yes sir i just keval press connect kar raha hu aur dusri id mein aapko jo hai aap logon ko call kar raha hu sir Okay, okay. Should I escape? Escape from? Ah, here? yes, yes. You can escape. No issue. Okay. Okay. <clears throat>